So welcome everyone to another seminar here in the seminar series. It's um, um, I'm very happy to have you all here. This is um, free webinar, so we get a lot of people from all over the world. And today we have Linda and Phil uh, to talk about systems thinking through storytelling. And I really hope that by the end of this webinar, you learn a little bit more, more on how to engage younger audiences on systems thinking and how to educate them in systems thinking. And I'm not going to take too much time from you, but if you're not a member of the System Dynamics Society, there's um, a lot of benefits of joining us. You have exclusive content and discounts in our partners, and you can join us at systemdynamics.org slash membership. And we have a date for our upcoming conference. We're going to meet in July, in August next year, in Bergen from 4th to 8th of August in Bergen, Norway. So... You can also prepare your submissions, prepare your work to submit for the conference and present at the uh, largest conference of the field of system dynamics. And I just wanna give a big shout out for all society sponsors. It's only through their help that we are able to continue to spread the word of system dynamics globally. And if you want to sponsor the society, we can start a conversation. You can just drop me a line at office at systemdynamics.org. Um, so we're going to be using poll everywhere today to collect some questions throughout Linda's and Phil's presentation. So you're familiar with, if you're, if you're not familiar with, you can scan this QR code on your screen. You can also type this uh, URL on your device. Um, and there's going to be a link in the chat. So you can just click, let me just paste in there, everyone. So I'm just going to go ahead and start with a um, simple question, which is, where are you joining us from? Um, so you can take this next 30 seconds to join us there. And then you're already in the platform, so you can ask your questions to Phil and Linda. So I see some people already there. Um, and it seems that Canada is win winning today. There's a lot of people from Canada, mm -hmm. uh, some people from London, Boston, Cambridge, Scotland, Stanley, Mexico. So we have people from all the continents here, a lot of different time zones. And I see Florida, uh, California, all people all over the US, but also here in Europe, Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. You can also say maybe in the chat if this is the first time you're joining or you've joined us before. Um, and I have a question here to learn a little bit more about you. Oops, going, sorry, it's the one. I want to know in me and the presenters want to know in what capacity are you attending today's session? You are maybe a parent, a grandparent, an educator, a facilitator maybe a community organizer, student, researcher, maybe all the things you can also say in the chat. And let's see here. It seems that most of you are researchers, but I see some educators and professors. Is this what you expected, Linda? More or less, you see 28% are researchers. Definitely, definitely a lot of a lot of the parent grandparent facility. I think people have multiple roles, right? Yeah. So feel free to do more, than, more one. than one thing. Yeah. Yeah, you can definitely pick more than one. So yeah. Um, I'm curious if anybody would shout out, even maybe in the chat, what their um the other is. You can leave a comment in the chat saying education hey, materials. What capacity are you you attending today's yeah. webinar? So thank you so much for answering this. Yeah. This is just for us to have an idea of uh, today's crowd. Um, just a brief agenda for today. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda and Phil are presenting for about 20 minutes each, and then we have uh, 20 minutes Q&A where you can have ask your questions. I'm going to ask my colleague Megan to talk about these two books here. Uh, Megan? Hi. So Linda's new book that came out in October is called Apart Together, a book about transformation. And she will be talking about her book as well as other resources that are useful for sharing with um, children. And then next, 
um, we'll be also talking about Bill Ramsey's books that have been published, the first three, um, and then the fourth one that's coming. So they are Billy Bonk and the Thorn Patch, Billy Bonk and the Bugs, The Floods of Nip, and The Dark Jungle. And um, Phil can share more information about those when he talks. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm going to happily introduce you to Linda. So she's an educator, author, and strategist, renowned for her contributions to fostering healthy, healthy social ecological systems change. She has co-authored several influential works, including the Systems Thinking Playbook and the Climate Change Playbook, along with numerous other books and journal articles. And she earned her doctorate from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And Phil is also an author and a senior lecturer at Massey University in New Zealand, specializing in organ organizational learning, leadership, and teamwork. His role extends beyond academia as he serves as the director of Insight Learning a consulting organization collaborating with schools, where he guides schools leaders to address complex challenges effectively. So thank you so much for Linda and Phil for being here and thank you all for joining us today. Um, that's all from my side, Linda, you can share your screen if you need to. I'm just gonna let you guys know that the Q&A is open. You can send your questions throughout that, pla that platform. All right. Um... Let me uh, just get this uh, going here. So assuming you can see this, okay? Oh, not not yet, right? Um, it's loading. Okay. Well, uh, it's it's. I'll just say while we're loading, <laughs> it's great, great, great to be here with you. Um, I am excited to partner with Phil, who. So have we known each other for, you know, at a distance for 30 years, I would say, maybe, right? Um, fellow travelers, because, you know, we come in through the organizational learning systems thinking, but we also have this love for storytelling. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know about you, but for me, it's super exciting to see the two worlds come together, right? They don't need to be separate, and which is kind of the theme of partly what I'm going to talk about. But so I want to share with you um, both some something about the new book, but also about a framework that can go along with the book. Um, and there are deceptively simple questions um, that I think can lay the foundation for early systems thinking, dialogue, critical thinking, and empathy. Um, but first, I just want to step back for a minute and give you um, a brief um, feel for where I've been over the last 30 years. I've been doing a lot of work in education, creating materials, um, creating animations, videos. I created something for PBS Learning Media uh, a few years back. That's a systems literacy pilot. And maybe, um, Fernando, you could pop the that link into the chat. But if people wanted to see that, it's you know, integrating systems into um, different age bands. Um, so that's, you know, just that, some that materials out there and it's free for anybody to access working with foundations, you know, how do we grant from a systemic perspective supply chains, doing a lot of work in climate change right now, no surprise. Um, I'm curating a, an exhibit around the bathtub as an analog, but um, combining art and science in the bathtub. That's in April in Massachusetts. If anybody wants to come to that, just connect with me. And then I'll, I'm doing a lot of work around visualizing food systems. And um, that was with the city of Guelph. I helped with that in Canada. Um, and then a lot have historically been working with communities. One of the um, projects, projects I did had to do with childhood obesity but, and bringing the whole community. So I um, work at all different aspects of the system. And um, I also currently work with the Obama Foundation with their scholars and with Columbia University with their um, fellows. And I'll tell you that what I'm finding is that um, it, I can see how beneficial it would be if they were exposed to systems thinking at an early age. It would be a more of a habitual way of thinking. They would be asking what, what, what happens next. They wouldn't be um, you know, okay with, you know, with focusing on 
you know, the problem without double clicking around it. They're, they're, I mean, they're doing great. I'm not trying to say that, but they, but some of the habits of mind could actually be developed earlier. And that's what I'm all, I'm very much focused on both with the, with this new book, but also in the kind of the work that I'm trying to do. So, whoops, um, hold on. Uh, did, did this just go off? Okay, so I just wanted to show that um, I, some somebody, uh, Rick, I think, held up one of the um, the the playbook. But the first book that I did in the systems world was this thinking playbook, and it's all experiential games. I used to work for Outward Bound, and that's where I got my the bug for learning experientially. And then um, having starting to have I have three kids, the Butterfly Sneezes book is all using picture books to teach you about systems. So some picture books that you know well, you know, like Dr. Seuss and you know other books like that. And the next book is The Connected Wisdom, and that is all folk tales from around the world. And the point there is that this is nothing new. The systems ideas are already in our our old uh, old tales and folk tales. And then the Climate change playbook is a, a is a lot of games, many from the systems thinking playbook, but all focused on um, uh, understanding the dynamics, but through the games. And then just quickly, the children's books that I started to write are when the wind blows and when the snow falls, and those are rhyming picture books for the little ones, you know, like three to five. Um, not so not so directly systems. This is just sort of a, a personal interest in the sculptor of the Lincoln Memorial, believe it or not, but one reviewer picked up the systems perspective that I had in it. So I guess they're, they're start, it started to connect. And then the one that we're gonna talk about now is um, something I'm super excited about, but it's this a part together book, which maybe it's hard to see, but, um, and uh, that's really the two worlds coming together. I do have another one coming out in March and that's called The Noisy Puddle. And it's about vernal pools again, from a systems perspective. So that's just another thing. All right, so um, why curious about connections? Um, this idea, so um, I really, um, I believe that what's happening right now, we need to um, pause and be able to like kind of stop the reactivity that's happening. And I think that being curious about connections can help us do that both with children and adults, but I wanna, um, let me give you a sense of, um, I think one of the, what we, one of, one, one of the reasons why we don't think about systems, I think that's probably a good place to start. When it, it this is a, um, actually a tried and true kind of a concept from Draper Kaufman. He was one of the original systems rock stars in my, in my mind. But one of the things, um, if you ask like a four-year-old and you say, if you cut a cow in half, do you get two cows? What do you think? Uh, not three. Three, I'm, I've, I've tested it. It's not as as tried and true, but maybe four or five. Um, any, you know, you could come off mute and just tell me what you think. They say no. They would say no way, right? They would say that, no, you can't do that. It's not going to get two cows. And if you said, you know, if I put the head in the front and the tail in the back, would it, would it still work? No, they know, and they actually know this. They know that they're parts. They know that the parts affect each other. They know that it matters how those parts are arranged matter, it, that matters. If I take the heart out of the cow, the heart doesn't work on its own. The, the cow doesn't work without the heart, right? They, they, that's a no-brainer for a five-year-old. They know that. If you move or remove a part, does it matter? Yes, they know that with a cow. Can the parts together do things that each part cannot do by itself? Yes, right? They interact to produce the ability for the cow to graze or to, I don't know if cows run, but you know those are all what we would call emergent properties, right? Um, that list is a, a list that I've used on the that, that PBS Learning Media site um, to help kids understand when something is a system. So, I'm trying to say that at a very young age, kids can really detect when, when something's a system, they don't have any of that language, but they know that intuitively the pieces that would make something a system. But what happens is as they get older, they're, they're starting to, they're, 
education starts to fragment that understanding. They're wired to connect, but I think they're educated to, fra to, um, to fragment. The natural world for them is, in, is separated. Um, natural science and the natural world, social science and the social world. And the, you know, as they get into school, you have history in one class, the bell rings, science in another class, literature in another class. And yet issues like climate, um, biodiversity loss, um, even like westward expansion, let's say in the US, if you're trying to understand how a country developed, those have to do with history, geography, science, um, you know, et cetera. And, we, we, and so they start to grow up through school. Typically there's a lot of schooling that doesn't do this, I have to say, but you know, at least that's how I um, got through it. Um, is is um, there there? Its knowledge is fragmented, but a, a systems view is not, and it requires that kind of crossover. So they have that. I mean, and, and actually, if you think about it, by the time they're in high school, you've got the theater people sitting at this table. You got the tech people, techies, you know, over there. The the athletes separate. So we're constantly specializing and separating. Um, and whoever is. Ab, Ab, I think if everybody could go on mute, um, that would be awesome. Thanks. Um, okay, so um, why else? Just I, 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 the reason why I'm going to go through this, I think it's so important, is that I noticed the different schools. I'm just going to, there we go. Um, I noticed that we have a lot of different people here with different roles. We have facilitators, we have leaders, we have parents, grandparents, students. Many of you in your roles are trying to help people think systemically, right? Why don't we? Well, I think the things that I'm, I'm telling you now are some of the reasons, and it's really important to understand that so that you can help people when they're reactive. You can understand that, like in this example right here, that they can't see systems. Have you ever seen a system walking around? <laughs> no, right? It's, it's you imagine the interactions that make up a system. Have we been taught to imagine and visualize those connections in, in school? Not really, not yet. I mean, certainly in pockets that's happening, Turkey, right? In some areas in the Netherlands and then, you know, certain parts of the US, there's schools that are actually doing that kind of thing, which is fabulous. But the majority of people know. So one is we can't see systems, right? They're intangible. So we have to use our imagination. Another are, are many of our everyday artifacts actually don't support systems thinking. And I'm going to show you that example in just a minute. Media pushes us to event focus, not to behavior changing over time. There's certainly some media you can find, but it's not your, the majority. It's all, you know, a, a Facebook post or a, you know, a, a headline that it doesn't give you any of the context. Um, like I said, schooling and also cognitive reasoning. We, on one level, you know, we can take a certain level of complexity, a certain number of factors, maybe it's seven or eight. And after that, we need help, right? So we need help in terms of maybe tracing it visually on a piece of paper or using a computer to help us, you know, understand how they're connected. But um, we also have certain um has to do with our mental models and has to do with we focus on where the action is so there's a lot of things that um we've been you know trained um that for i think also inhibit systems thinking but let me just give you an example we can try this out um oops so whoops sorry <laughs> okay so this is a, a picture from that book called connected wisdom and um, my question to you is the, the illustrator who was a really well-known New Yorker illustrator had a joke here. Um, it took me a while to figure out what the joke is. So what would you say is his aha or ha ha here? And please, I mean, we're not that big of a group. So feel free to come off. If you wanna just shout it out, it's okay. Is that the Thomas Jefferson Memorial? <laughs> mm, I don't know. It's his, it's his, his the, interpretation. The, All right. Yeah, the, the route from that tree on the hillside Freeze. is really long. So. Okay, right. I think I think somebody might have picked that up. But a, a lot of times, we could I could sit here for a very long time with a group and 
you know, it's, it's hard to actually, if you're, if you, what happens is we focus on where the action is, right? And the action in this case has to do with the farmer pulling that root, right? So we, we can come up with all kinds of stories, but the, the illustrator's joke here is that root is actually pulling down that tree over there. Um, it's not like a really hilarious joke, okay? I understand that. But from a systems perspective, it hits home this idea that cause and effect are separated in time and space often. We have, let's say, a president who puts a policy in action, and then four years later, that policy starts to, you know, uh, take, uh, you know, show up with the, the, in, the impact of it, and you have a new president, right? So cause and effect can be separated in time and space, but what our tendency is, is to focus on just where the pain point is, where the action is. We don't necessarily lift our, our perspective up to look around, and that's another reason why those people that you're working with in whatever capacity, whether you're trying to understand it from a research perspective or you're a teacher or you're a manager, um, know that that's a really natural tendency. And you in your role have to help say, yeah, I can see why that would be where all the energy is going, but, and then you help them kind of lift up and um, look at the context around. Um, another reason why we don't see systems, and like I said, some of it has to do with our everyday artifacts. So some of you might have seen this before, but this is an actual, um, you know, question from a seventh grade textbook. And my question for you is you're a seventh grader, right? And you're sitting there and your teacher asks you question number one, what process begins the water cycle? So let me ask. Somebody other than Jamie, because I know Jamie knows this one. <laughs> um, what do you think? What would you say as a seventh grader? You're going to get graded on this, by the way. Precipitation. Okay, precipitation. Anybody else? Evaporation. Okay. It's a cycle. It doesn't have a start. Thank you. <laughs> Vivian, is that you? Okay. Yes. 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 And you feel free to come on. You know, the more I see people, the better I do. So, you know, anyway, um, I exactly, this is, if you were a child who really understood that a cycle doesn't have a beginning and an end, and you're have to answer that question, can you imagine the cognitive dissonance that you'd feel? Right. So it's a cycle. It doesn't, it doesn't actually, you can't point to a place where it starts or ends. However, this kind of line of thinking is where we get the blame game. You know, um, what's happening, you know, I, I won't even go to what's happening right now. Um, but you know, if, if there's a fight, you know, it was them, it was them versus stepping back to look at the pattern of interaction that's creating, let's say, this the escalation of two bullies on a playground or something, you know, but that, that mindset of there's a beginning and an end when there's actually a, a closed loop is very common. And we can help again, in your role, you can understand how people get there, but your role is to help them step back and see, actually, wait, there's a pattern here. And when you can see the pattern, you can shift the pattern. That's the, that's the thing. So last, uh, there's so many reasons we could spend a whole webinar on the reasons why we don't think systemically, but I wanna give you one more. The other is we, we tend to think in straight lines when closed feedback loops are present. So for example, um, I have a problem, you know, solution, make it go away. I've got a headache. I take, let's say, you know, aspirin. Um, okay, fine. But you know, maybe the reason I have a headache is more complicated than that and has to do with um, I'm not hydrated enough. You know, I, there's could be, it, it, I'm just saying the, the very frequent response is problem, make the pain go away, right? Sometimes that can make matters worse and often it does. So let's just take a really simple exa example. Thank you, George Richardson for the early, you know, sharing this one with me but if you have traffic you know often the the impulse is expand the highway let's get more lanes right this is an actual picture from thanksgiving in the u.s you know a couple of years ago in um, los angeles 
really, you know, that that's the pain, right? We want to make that pain go away. So again, like I said, the impulse can be, let's make the, um, if commuting time is going um, up, let's, oops, sorry, my apologies. Let's, let's widen the roads. As we widen the roads, um, <laughs> Hold on a second. One second. As we widen the roads, con highway construction goes up and there. Really what should be there is the lanes, an extra lane goes in and over time, commuting time goes down, right? Problem solved. Well, actually, as commuting time goes down, not as much pain, right? Attractiveness of the outlying areas goes up. Population in those outlying areas can go up. number of commuters can go up. And what do you think happens to commuting time? Just, just like thumbs up. What do you think, up or down? Really good to take a, as, as the number of commuters goes up, right? Number, amount of commuting time goes up. So we've, pro, our problem, our solution actually had a feedback loop that made that can make the mat the mat the situation worse, right? Here's I could go like I said I could go on many many reasons, and I'm saying these to you because I want you to have um, empathy. I want you to have patience, and I want you to be able to meet people in their reactivity so that they can be less reactive. And the way I would love to see it start is with five year olds, <laughs> and so. Um, and here's what I mean. So there's something we can do about it and we can ask really good questions, a couple of simple questions, and we can encourage children, but I would say adults too, to make their thinking visible. All right. So in the systems world, um, uh, actually, let me just explain one thing. Um, when I was a doctoral student, I created something called the systems based inquiry tool, and it was five different um, scenarios. And one of them had to do with um, predator and prey relationships. And what I found was that without any prompts, no questions, students, these are like 10 year old students and, the, and their teachers, okay? So I had both populations. Students, 15% of the students and 32% of the teachers could get the kind of closed loop nature of a predator prey relationship. And what I mean by that is as the wolf population goes up maybe rabbit population goes down, right? As that rabbit population goes down, over time it would feed back and reduce the wolf population if that was their only source. So that was pretty low numbers, right? With simple questions, the number of students, just a simple question like, well, wait a second, what would happen next? What would, instead of wolf, this is what they, what, what they said before the prompt, wolves, wolves eat the rabbits, end of story. If, if you ask a simple question like, what would happen next, a prompt, 37% of the students could start to close the loop, 60% of the teachers close the loop. So prompts equals good questions, okay? So that, that's my invitation. And the three questions that I would suggest are these curious about connections questions, but I'll just say quickly, it uses three questions to encourage people of all ages to visualizing connections that shape our world. And I think these questions support the development of early systems literacy, a growth mindset, and I'll explain that, social emotional learning and build resilience by helping children feel more confident when they're dealing with complex problems as they grow older. I, I think we have to give kids the credit. We have to believe that they can deal with complexity, especially if they're given some ways to visualize it and to, to share their thinking um, about it. So um, the three questions are, um, what's happening here? Notice, oops, my, my computer is, what, what is, what, what if, what if this is connected to that and that, you know, you can kind of modify that. That's the wonder, okay? What if, and then the connect part is where we actually do something where we're visualizing what caused what to change. And that's where they can create, you know, pictures, drawings, you know, all different kinds of things. 
um, the, the reason why I connected to growth mindset is the what if question is where you start to have to imagine. It's a really good, it can, these kind of connection circles, okay, simple connection circles, causal loop diagrams, and I'm assuming that, that we all are familiar with some of these things. Iceberg models a little more sophisticated, right? Not for the little ones, maybe a little, I mean, yes, but a little older, I would say not like three, five. Definitely things like post-it notes. And um, so the one thing I wanna show is that if you start at like five, let's say, and you're doing connection circles or you know, even just starting to use something like, um, like this, like I did with, this was a group with teenagers, we used post-it notes and we used wiki sticks. Right, and so you're just looking at interconnectivity using string or you know whatever. The on the right hand side is a pretty sophisticated um, graphic from the World Economic Forum about the climate impact of travel, and you can see that the similar kind of thinking that went on in the connection circle and with these teenagers is leads up to the same kind of thinking that the World Economic Forum it did is did so beautifully in this graphic. So we, I, I would love to see more, um, you know, young adults, adults arrive um, with the skills to be able to do this kind of thinking. Um, so where can you do Curious About Connections? I'm gonna show you with the book that um, I mentioned. Um, you can also talk about it like in sit, like with a family, sibling rivalry, you know, like, you know, you one, this actually happened with my kids where they, you know, I have three, but the two boys were kind of having a, you know, snow day, kind of push, push kind of each other. And when we actually laid it out, one of, they realized that it was like a figure eight on its side, you know, one pushed, the other pushed back, the other felt threatened, the other one pushed, you know, and when I asked them, what's the, you know, what's the deal with that figure eight, they said, the older one said, well, that could go on forever. And that's the whole point is they can see the system. Right. Um, so anyway, the curious about connection questions, I'll, I'll show you with the book, but also we can show you with an example in the classroom and the this this healthy chickens, healthy pastures is um, something that the creative learning exchange uh, I worked on with them That's on a farm. Same thing, looking at the connections on the farm and how they produce, you know, um, new qualities on the farm, like more nutrient dense soil, um, et cetera. So, okay, so let's take a look. Um, this in the book, there's eight different scenes every day of every of child's everyday life, you know, uh, like a could be a, a garden, it could be washing hands, it could be playing a sport or um, creating a nest, you know, sort of going to bed kind of thing. Um, but if we ask the question, what's happening here? What if this is connected to that? The, the, the what happened, what's happening here, a child might say something as simple as, I see um, seeds or I see pink boots or maybe there's water in that can, right? So they start to just notice, that's it. There's no right or wrong. And then they, then if you prompt them to say, well, how? what if the seeds and the water and the sun and that dirt, you know, what if they were connected? What could change? What would happen? And then the next, as the, the big thing about this book is it's all about the page turn because at each point when you're asking what if, then they guess what happens when it changes. Uh, in this case, it makes beans. Um, and then if you want to, because the third thing connect, this connect part, we're gonna try really hard to like help them uh, create visuals. Um, one, this is a little more sophisticated, but you know, you could talk about decaying as, a, as the beans plants decay, they, they put, they feed the soil. And as they feed the soil, the soil becomes healthier. It helps to grow, you know, both grasses, but also more bean plants. And, you know, then the, the show how the cycle continues and it creates low waste and more, um, you know, nutrients, nutrient dense soil. Um, so how am I doing time-wise? Do I have like two minutes or? Yeah, about that, Minda. Okay, well, let me show you just one or two more how we might be able to use these three questions. So that's in the book, but there are, like I said, eight different scenes and really well suited for just perhaps just trying those notice, wonder and connect uh, questions. 
and and see my what I'm actually should have said at the very beginning was I would love to see how this works for you. Um, this is a, a methodology that um, in many ways was inspired by um, if, if some of you are familiar with visual thinking strategies, which asks three questions about art. You know, what do you see? What makes you say that? What more can you say? And what's really interesting about visual thinking strategies is it's now been picked up by, I know like Harvard Medical School um, uses those same three simple questions. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense because if you have a body on the table, what do you see? What makes you say that, right? And so this, it, don't be, don't be um, swayed by the simplicity of the questions because uh, it can really um, create a, no, a non-judgmental way of getting people's, um, what, they, what they're actually seeing and they're thinking out. Um, so, so that others can um, engage with it. So if we want to use those same questions around, let's say, kindness in the classroom, and I'll just give this last one, what do you notice? So let's say you're, you're trying to talk to your class about uh, kindness. Um, what are the parts of kindness? Well, some children might say, well, let's see, you know, it has to do with how the teacher's feeling that day and what the kids are saying to me and, you know, what I respond back, or, you know, that, or what somebody's face looks like. So, you know, um, are they always kind of looking sour or, you know, the, all these different factors they could come up with. And then ask, you know, what if the parts are interconnected? What, would, what could they interconnect to create more kindness? And at first it might come out in that kind of straight line thinking that we talked about. Um, nice words. Maybe if somebody said nice words, we get nice feelings. Okay. Well, that's where we got to go that next step, right? We got to say, well, what else? What could happen next? And now with encouragement, children might be able to look at how one thing influences another, influences another. So the more um, nice feelings I have about others, the more friendship skills I can use, the more I feel nice about uh, others, nice feelings about me make me even feel more inclined to be, you know, friends, whatever they come up with. This was actually first inspired by the Waters Foundation. Um, but you can see just encouraging that kind of thinking um, in both with, with children's books, but also in a lot of other everyday um, scenarios. Um, so I think, I think if I'm running out of time, I might ha um, have to, do I have like, Two minutes for Amanda for now? You, you're a bit over time, Linda. Oh, okay. Let but... me just go to the very end because everybody can, if they want to, um, there is, maybe if you could put in the chat, I have a, a companion guide to the book that has um, all kinds of like simple activities you can do and these three questions. And so there's a, a link that you can get that. Um, and I'm just going to go to the very last slide then and we'll show... Um, all right, I'm going to skip the part. Um, what, what does it take to have a curious about connections conversation? I would say ask as much as you can open-ended questions that spark exploration and imagination. Um, avoid providing the immediate answers. So if you ask, if you say, what do you notice? Don't say, well, don't you see the seeds? <laughs> you know, let, let the child um, be the one to provide the answers. Try to really foster a respect uh, and intent of listening without judgment. That's the key so that they can feel free to, to say what they see and what they think. Um, that also creates a really nice inclusive dialogue situation with other kids. Um, and encourage kids to express and visualize their thoughts through words, drawings, objects. It could be, you know, but show how they think they think the interconnections might produce something. Um, greater. So I think we'll just stop there. And um, I know uh, we'll talk later at the end with any questions. Thank you, Linda. We're now um, moving to Phil. And Phil, don't don't worry. Don't, don't feel that you have to uh, hurry your presentation. So take your time. Well, thank you very much, Fernando. And thank you, Linda. It's uh, lovely to be part of this um, symposium. And it's uh, great to be able to share the session with uh, with Linda, as she says, we've known each other for years, and uh, it's great to reconnect. 
Um, I'd also you know, really like to thank uh, Megan and Rebecca from uh, Systems Dynamics, all the support that uh, you've given with the publication of uh, the Billy Bonk and Frankel series. Um, and to uh, Diana Fisher uh, with the Education um, Special Interest Group. Um, a little bit about the uh, the series. The, the first two Billy Bonk and Frankel books were published back in the 1990s. Uh, and they've been out of print for for some time. Then a year or two ago, I got a uh, an email from Diana asking if I was interested in having them republished. And um, I had no idea that people even still knew about the books. So uh, it was delightful to to get that contact uh, contact. And I, I got also got to say, oh by the way, <laughs> there's another completed third book and um, half of a fourth book. So uh, it all of a sudden turned into a, a bigger project and um, it, it's been delightful that uh, that it's played out. So this symposium for me is a, is really a book launch. Um, I'd be drinking champagne, except it's um, for a, it's a 7 p.m., 7.30 on, uh, 7.30 a.m., sorry, in New Zealand. So it's a little bit uh, early morning for, for me down here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how the books came about, um, my thoughts on storytelling and the connection with systems thinking, and some of the principles for using the books and, and other stories uh, to teach systems thinking. Um, these, the Billy Bonk and Frankel series is, when I first started writing them, they were aimed at an audience of about two, <laughs> that is my own children, who were uh, around six, seven, eight, but advanced readers, it turns out, um, aiming for around age 10 is the way that uh, they've developed. So nice, nicely complementing uh, the earlier childhood work that, uh, that Linda has been doing. Um, now, as you'd expect in a symposium about systems thinking, uh, the things that we're going to, that I mentioned, how the books came about, storytelling and uh, systems thinking, the principles on how to use them, they're all connected. So uh, let's start with how the books came about. Um, around uh, 1990, I was uh, teaching management, training and development, uh, topics like that at, uh, at Massey University in New Zealand. Um, and I started reading some of the work of Ian Mitroff, who uh, was writing about crisis management in the light of disasters like the Exxon Valdez oil spill, the Challenger space shuttle uh, disaster. And Mitroff wrote something that, <laughs> so, that really struck a chord with me, um, where he said that a lot of textbooks on management and organizational behavior, they teach a really insipid version of what really happens at work all the interesting stuff gets left out. Um, and I thought there was so much truth to that. And then I started exploring organizational learning and systems thinking. And it felt like finally here was a field that uh, allowed for all the interesting parts of organizational life to be addressed and explored. So um, I was really drawn to this. It, it created some challenges for me. So how do you how much do you need to know before you start teaching a subject? And that was one one challenge because I really wanted to start to, uh, teaching this to people down here in New Zealand who I, I saw really needed to, to learn more. Um, how do you teach organizational learning and systems thinking at a university which has, uh, kind of requirements on how teaching happens and how assessment is done. And how do you do it in a way that really aligns with the subject matter? How do you make sure that the values and how it's taught match the values in the content? And the third big question for me is, um, why start teaching systems thinking at a postgrad level when my six, seven... <laughs> year old also really needs to learn uh, and that's the issue that Linda was talking about that mm -hmm. um, if we wait until they are in the workplace well it, it isn't a habit of mind the first uh, the first challenge of um, how much do you need to know well it turns out in New Zealand 
uh, not so much. Um, as long as you can learn fast, then uh, you can uh, start teaching pretty quickly. Um, trying to uh, trying things out, both with my children and with my students at the university, set up a nice uh, reinforcing cycle of learning for me that meant I could learn fast. Uh, I could try out all sorts of things. I could learn quickly and still have a legitimate course. And storytelling was really an experiment that I tried both at the university and at home that kept working. It worked in both settings um, because it disrupted a lot of what went wrong, both with teaching at university and as a parent. Um, in particular, I'd been frustrated that uh, that a lot of teaching at the university was very linear. You saw the um, problem solution um, diagram that Linda had. Well, similarly, a linear approach to teaching involves the teacher saying, well, here's the need. Here's the material I'm going to deliver in response to it. The material gets learned, gets assessed, and then everything stops. Um, and that seemed to also mirror the kinds of conversations or lack of conversation that uh, that would be had in uh, many classrooms. Um, it mirrored what Adam Kahane described about uh, conversation, where he said that for many, the default way of talking was telling, and the default way of listening was not listening. Um, for a postgrad class, storytelling uh, was a way of breaking out of that default for the for the postgrad students. That mainly involved students telling their stories about their own efforts to introduce. Uh, um, organizational learning concepts and to apply some systems thinking in their workplace. Um, and each year, I, that's accelerated my learning because I got to learn uh, from the efforts that they'd made, dozens of students trying things out, uh, trying to make things work in a New Zealand context. But then at home, as a creative exercise, I, I I started making up stories to tell my children. Uh, so Alexandra and Nicholas I was practicing on them, usually as a way of uh, addressing issues that they were having in their lives. Uh, and there were, as a parent, you can imagine there are always new issues coming along. So one evening, um, a little bit like uh, the snow day fight at, uh, at Linda's house, well, this was a parent-child conflict um, came about at dinner time, where Nicholas refused to eat his dinner. Um, I think it was broccoli, and he had no interest in it. And the more we talked, the more stuck we got uh, in the conflict that we were having. We went down to uh, his room, and I thought, oh, I'll make up a story. And I made up a story about an elephant who uh, got stuck in a thorn patch. And immediately with the story, the relationship between us changed. Um, we, was, we, we still had uh, the disagreement, but um, rather than being in combat, we were having some fun. Um, even, and even though both of us knew that it was kind of serious, uh, we were able to talk through what, what we could learn and how we could address the challenge that we face. So um, afterward, I thought that would actually be the, a very good first chapter of a, a children's book about systems thinking. Now, that helped me to see a connection between storytelling and systems thinking, because there was a systems archetype um, escalating conflicts that I could use as a way of uh, un, you know, making the story play out. And systems archetypes really lend themselves to stories and to creating stories. So in the first book, Billy Bonk and the Thorn Patch, I could build that, uh, that story around this escalating conflict that I had had with, uh, with Nick. Um, because it was my first effort at, uh, at writing a novel, I, I tried to do too much um, and thought, oh, I'd better build in a, another archetype as well. So I've also managed to fit the tragedy of the commons into, uh, into the story. Um, 
other books have uh, been a little simpler. Uh, so um, Billy Bonk and the Bugs is uh, is based around uh, shifting the burden. Um, the Floods of Nith uh, includes some um, uh, includes accidental adversaries, or is based around that. There's a limits to growth um, process that shaped my thinking for the Dark Jungle. Uh, in the books, um, you, you'll, you'll find that what we've done um, at uh, system, uh, system Dynamics Society is that we've provided some resources in the form of videos where we explain some of the um, uh, some of these systems archetypes and causal loop uh, diagrams that um, help you understand what's what's behind some of the books, and you can see the connection there between um, storytelling and systems thinking. But basically, for me, uh, systems thinking directly connects with storytelling in a way because um, systems so often provide the structure for a plot, which is one of the things that um, uh, Linda has explored with, with the uh, Connecting Wisdom, Wisdom book. Uh, here are all these um, stories from, uh, from folklore that really have systems embedded in them. It's, it's no surprise because systems uh, archetypes are natural um, ways of expressing different plots. But there's more to, uh, to stories than just the content. Um, stories hold your attention because you connect with characters. Uh, you see the characters having to wrestle with personal challenges. You empathize with, with how they feel. You understand, for instance, um, why it's so tempting to jump at a, a quick fix, at a symptomatic solution, um, rather than grind it out to, <laughs> to find out what what would what's the fundament what's going on, what's the fundamental solution that needs to happen, and how do I make sure that that gets implemented, even when it takes time, and I'm having to deal with these uh, these painful symptoms. And when you see a that a character can overcome challenges that are similar to ones that you're experiencing in some other part of your life, uh, especially if the story is plausible, if, your if the characters in the story have come up with a plausible way of addressing um, something similar to what is going on in your life, well, it really gives you hope. So in a story, and uh, this is what uh, we, we've aimed to do with the Billy Bonko and Frankel series. It isn't just a case of the characters investigating what is happening in a system that they are observing as spectators. Um, each character is participating as part of the system. And along with that, a, a child who reads the story and is thinking, well, this is like what's happening in my life. I'm a little bit like Billy Bonk, or I'm a little bit like Frankel, or um, I, I, I'm a little bit like that hippo. Uh, the child becomes a participant in the system as well. Uh, as an example, uh, not long after Thornpatch was first published, uh, a local teacher um, was uh, started reading the story with children in her classroom. Um, and one of the children spoke to her after the lesson and, and said something like, um, so lesson I'm learning is you don't always have to get things right the first time. Um, the teacher and the student, they, they had uh, a short conversation about an insight that this young girl had had based on the story. It was something that, that the, the girl couldn't quite articulate and which the teacher couldn't really understand because she couldn't connect it to what they'd just read. But a couple of days later, the girl's parents came to the school to ask about what had gone on in the lesson because their daughter had started going to sleep at night much more easily than she uh, than she'd been doing so uh, in, earlier. Now, I wish I could give you more detail because I wish I knew what I had put in the story that made a difference or had produced the insight, but I, I have no clue. And uh, similarly, the teacher and the parents, uh, they don't really know. Um, so I didn't deliberately insert anything. The 
teacher doesn't really know. Um, it's all part of uh, a, a complex system that was going on for with that this child was part of, uh, and actually that the parents and the teacher and I were part of too. <laughs> I like to uh, think of this um, as the Swiss cheese nature of of learning uh, and of storytelling. Can you um, can you picture a, a a chunk of Swiss cheese in your mind? Make it. A, a wedge so that it seems to be heading in a particular direction it's pointing somewhere so of course Swiss cheese is uh, notable of course it's famous for its holes now when I'm writing I may have a direction in mind um, writing the cheesy bit um, no pun intended uh, but I have I also need to leave holes uh, sometimes uh, the holes relate to the characters. I have in mind the nature of an archetype I would really like to express and I would like people to be able to understand. But as I write the story, I have to let the characters' personalities shape the decisions that they make, how they're going to react to one another and so forth. So as I'm writing, um, I can't just make it a lecture about the archetype I have to let things play out um, and actually let the characters fill in holes in where the story might go. Um, to help with that and with my storytelling, I found a couple of things very useful. Uh, you might know the work of uh, Sandra Siegel and David Horn on um, uh, human dynamics. Um, I make sure that um, the personality dynamic of each character is something I can define using uh, human dynamics, which means I can be more consistent with uh, each character's reactions to things. Um, I also imagine characters with uh, with a unique voice so I can hear what they might sound like as they speak. Um, I've got a, a grumpy uh, friend who originates from um, the Czech Republic, and I hear his voice when one of my characters is uh, is, is speaking, for instance. Um, so somehow that allows me to let these characters come to life and occasionally they surprise me with uh, with how they react because the conversation sort of emerges more more naturally and it for me it also makes the storytelling more fun um, but so Swiss cheese as a writer means leave not being so concerned of, about having everything thought out ahead of time, having some holes for the characters to uh, de to develop into. But how can a, a Swiss cheese approach uh, help you when you're trying to teach a child? Well, one of the things you, um, you may know about um, Swiss cheese is that the Swiss have been having some problems with their cheese lately and that there aren't enough holes. Uh, the holes seem to have been disappearing from um, from Swiss cheese. Uh, and a current theory is that the holes are the result of uh, microscopic wheat particles in the uh, in the the buckets that uh, people collect milk in. Um, so as cheese production here in Switzerland has become more sanitized and uh, you know everything has become more hygienic and clean, um, the holes have started to disappear, uh, which um, clearly the Swiss are concerned about. Now, I, they're trying to introduce a more a less hygienic cheese <laughs> to bring the holes back. Um, now, I like the metaphor that this creates. Um, the better the Swiss got at cheese making, the fewer holes. Well, the danger for us as parents, teachers, grandparents, is uh, the more the clearer we are about what we are trying to teach, the more we might fill in all the holes, leaving the learner with no space to make a contribution for themselves. Um, we need, we've kept this in mind um, as we have uh, prepared resources, for instance, for Billy Bonk uh, and the Billy Bonk and Frankel series. Um, we've got some uh, posters that uh, you can find on the System Dynamics uh, website. But even as we're discussing these, 
Um, I was surprised that some of the archety archetypes that I thought uh, we should uh, were, were really the basis for the stories weren't the only ones that uh, that people could see in the stories and there was like no end of possibilities for what posters we could create we held back we didn't want to create too much because we want uh, people to be able to develop their own resources um we, we've avoided trying to fill in all the holes. The, the folks at the uh, Water Center for Systems Thinking, for instance, um, suggested that um, we don't want to give too much, too many resources to teachers because really they need to be able to uh, develop their own, their own lesson plans. Um, when we, when the books were first published back in the 1990s, uh, the publisher Pegasus. Communications and I, we provided field books for adults who wanted to uh, apply lessons from the books in their own workplaces, um, which in hindsight was like filling in a hole that resulted in us getting a little bit confused about who the books were really for. So now, while I I'm delighted when adults read the books and uh, enjoy them and learn from the stories, um, I'm being much more deliberate about uh, about keeping in mind that these are books for children, and it's it's a bonus if uh, if parents like them as well. Uh, to to wrap up, um, if you're a, if you're using the books to teach a child, you need to make sure as well that you take a Swiss cheese approach that you don't fill in all the holes for the child. Uh, Linda's presentation about uh, emphasize the need for an inquiry-based approach, helping children to um, think about what they are seeing, what, what's coming to their minds. Also helping children develop their own questions as a basis for their inquiry. Inquiry is a great way forward. So aim to make any lesson you have with a child a conversation where you are really open to being surprised uh, at how they fill in the holes that uh, you've left available. And that's uh, my introduction to the Billy Bonk and Frankel series. And um, I'll hand back to Fernando because I'm sh um, we'd love to hear any of the questions you have. Uh, you okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, we do have a lot of comments while we were speaking in here in the chat. Um, we're slightly over time, but I, I want to go through a few questions here. We have in a uh, poll everywhere. Uh, so we um, appreciate everyone that sent these questions here. And now I'm just going to start with this one that I pasted from the chat here in the poll uh, everywhere. And the first one is uh, how different are these new series of Billy Bong books from the previous version? So the, the first two books are the same with a bit of a freshen up. We've changed some of the names. Um, we've uh, tidied up some things. Um, I've never really felt compelled to being strongly factual when I discuss how elephants and mice and other animals uh, behave. I don't want that to get in the road of the story I'm trying to tell. But occasionally, uh, you know, I found uh, things like, you know, I'd written how the mice could hear Billy Bonk uh, coming as he thudded towards them. And then, you know, realizing actually I've since learned that uh, elephants are very quiet when they walk and that could be useful in a future book. <laughs> I'd better change that. But basically the first two books are um, very much the same as they, uh, they were when first published. The, the uh, um, floods of Nith and the dark jungle are completely new. Same characters. Um, we do have a couple more. Uh, did you purposely craft the Billy Bonk stories based on the archetypes, or did you discover a story as you were writing one? Uh, surprise, expressing the archetypes. Thank you, Rick. Uh, the initially the first books um were. Uh, more deliberately based on the archetypes. Um, there's there, there's a, a cyclical, you know, there's a relationship between the nature of the story and the archetype. The archetype provides an initial prompt, um, gives some insights into how things might play out, 
Um, but uh, so I'd say, yes, they, they are crafted around the archetypes. You still have to make it a, um, a plausible and enjoyable story as you go. Uh, target age for the um, for the books. Uh, we're thinking around like middle school. Um, would, is that uh, age around nine, ten, eleven, something like that? Sorry, I was muted. And Linda. Um, for me, the target age for a part together is between uh, three and seven. Okay, younger ages. Uh, and then we have questions here. Is is the book available in Europe? And this came in when Linda was speaking. I think it actually applies for both of you. Um, there's been an, a lot of interest in, in different countries. Um, and I, I'm not, I'm not, a, I know it will be. Uh, I know a, a friend. I think in the Netherlands ordered it, and it will be coming in January. So I think it's you'd have it. You definitely can order it, and then you have to see what they say. Um, but yeah, it's meant to be available worldwide. And I think same for you, right, Phil? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, with the um, available in different languages, one of the initial prompts was the. Um, educators in Turkey who were very keen to have um, more resources available in Turkish uh, and I'm not sure how that um, that is progressing um, I, I hope that that uh, the momentum of that is keeping up yeah we're not sure we haven't um, heard back from them but um, in terms of having it available in English language in other places we're using Ingram Spark which has um, publishing arms throughout the world. And, and Megan is going to be um, experimenting with uh, sending from them rather than Amazon so that it'll be available and available cheaper for people in other countries. And I wasn't sure if this was mentioned, but there's a Turkish publisher that's working on publishing the first two books in the series. Right. I guess, Megan, I don't know if there's an update. I think we haven't heard from them. It's stalled a little bit. We've got a nutshell. Is, yeah, they're stalled at the moment, but they're working on it. <laughs> well, that was all the questions we had. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Linda. Thank you, Phil, again, for being here. Uh, there's a link in your email inbox now um, for a survey. So if you could just briefly answer this um, survey would help us improve the series. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Rebecca. You guys um, have any final um, words? I would just like to thank uh, Linda and Phil, who are both a pleasure to work with and always um, welcome for seminars. Uh, really glad to hear about your new book, Linda. And it's been a joy working with Phil on these books. We're excited to be making a foray into to publishing new things again. Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you all for hosting us. Yes, I want to give a thanks to you both as well and all of our participants for joining us today. I think it was really helpful to hear Linda and Phil's perspectives. And you have lots of admirers, as you can see in the chat. <laughs> <sighs> Wonderful. Thank you. To be continued. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you. And thank you to the pre-college education SIG for um, also really being an instigator for getting this uh, done. Diana Fisher really encouraged us uh, in the publishing of the Billy Bonks series. So that's been a really helpful nudge. Yes. <laughs> thank you so many of the members from that SIG for joining us today. Yeah. Um. Uh, and Linda, um, New Zealand is still an awesome place for a writing retreat. Uh, oh, twist my, twist my arm. <laughs> Let's write together. <laughs> we first met at a um, at a lake in New Zealand where 
um, a group that I've been working with had invited you out as a, to do an intro right. uh, session. And uh, what a fabulous spot that was! That is was. still Okatina. One of my one of my most favorite memories. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much again. Um, we hope to continue the conversation too. We're gonna share the recording and other um, extra resources via email. If you need anything, you can also uh, just ask us. Thank you so much. All right.